Welcome. Welcome. Well, welcome. Everything that has a beginning has an end, Richard, mostly. <laughs> Hi, this is Louis Brammeyer. That's Richard Futrell, and we are Clever Orbits. Today we are discussing the movie known as The Matrix Revolutions. Uh, I've certainly had a revolution in understanding and appreciating what's going on with this film in the past week, thanks to some very careful application of observation and note-taking. And I really love it. Uh, well, just one sentence, man, what would you think? I found it intriguing. Mm-hmm. It certainly is at the very least that. Um, I'm going to launch right off into this. The, uh, the, the film is brilliant. Um, the film is absolutely fascinating and engrossing, and I think that what's really going on here uh, has everything to do with the golden code in those final moments between Neo and Smith. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of you know, thoughts that I had around that, uh, the classic interpretation is still mind is green is the matrix, blue is body is Zion, and spirit is yellow or gold um, and is only visible to Neo ultimately uh, a- after he uh, gains a certain level of awareness that we find him possessing and re- reloaded when he sees Seraph. And especially it becomes palpable in the external physical world after he loses his sight. Uh, and we see examples like him seeing Agent Smith as code, which is interesting because when he looks at Agent Smith, he doesn't see Bane or he doesn't see someone who's shaped like Bane. He sees the program wearing the suit that Agent Smith is. Uh, like encoded within almost the spiritual essence, so to speak, for lack of a better term, of that program subsisting through the medium of Bane. And uh, he, of course, then knocks the head off of Agent Smith, which is really satisfying, uh, even if it was only (laughs) one of many Smiths. And so the the Golden Code, we we learn a lot about this. And I'm just going to talk about the Golden Code in that last, minute or, or some of the themes I saw in this, paint, paint a pretty broad picture. Um, the camera opens the film, which by the way, this, this film, I've definitely got more questions than answers, more curiosities than observations, more intrigue than interpretation even. Uh, it's the most ambiguity of the entire trilogy, and I'm pretty sure the, the Wachowskis intended that. There's a lot that has to be decided by the viewer, like decided, not just interpreted, but like, all right, I'm going to make a choice about what this means or how this works, and then piece together. And that, interestingly enough, we'll come back around to in a little bit, but that is, I think, the primary theme of the film itself, is this process of both decoding and also choosing a meaning or interpretation or a view for a complex and an intricate experience, and in this way it actually uh, represents life or uh, the experience of being in existence, trying to make sense of it all, all of that. So the first time we see Golden Code in this film, it's, you know, just like we, we have in the previous two films, we have this explosion of matrix code, the, the green rain it's called, uh, that, that shows up, or the digital rain, whatever, uh, that shows up in the very beginning of the film. And this time it's different. The camera first, after the, the, you know, the Matrix Revolutions shows up as, as the title card, the camera goes into the darkness behind the code, which to me is really fascinating. It's like this figure ground thing. The figure is the code itself. The ground, the background is the black. And from what does this code emerge? So there's this explosion of golden code, which is really visually exquisitely beautiful. There are these fractals and all kinds of other things. And it gives this sense that the golden code underlies and composes the matrix code. So there's a more primal code. There's a more, um, a deeper level of reality, even than body. And it turns into a simple Neoplatonism. Mind is less than body is less than spirit somehow. Maybe people could view it that way. However, 
I think that the film is also trying to say, as we see later, there are three lines that Neo points to as the direction that Trinity needs to take them on when they're taking the hovercraft back to Machine City. And these three lines come together at the source. They are the three layers of the cake of consciousness in in this uh, science of enlightenment metaphor we've been returning to, the source of consciousness, the surface, and then the intermediate realms that Neo has been exploring since uh, roughly the end of the first film. They're the three factions in this conflict, the machines, Zion, and then the random sort of one-off programs, the Oracle, the Merovingian, uh, the Train Man, whatever. They're kind of their own faction. And then finally, the three parts of, of human consciousness, mind, body, and spirit. So it's, this film is about sort of the revolution that happens individually and collectively when we integrate all of who we are and, and ecologically and um, societally all the parts of who we are. And, and so that's kind of a big, broad uh, uh, stroke right there. But the gold code, so the, the gold code is what I see to be our spiritual essence. And I, I have this theory that what's going on is neurotheological. So we see later that the entire infrastructure of the machine city and the machines, um, even the fields where they harvest people, it's, it's in gold code. And th- this is going to come off as a really weird, fascinating dystopia, and it makes the film a lot better and a lot cooler than most of the dominant interpretations out there. I believe that the machines got there first. To where? To enlightenment, to embody- full embodiment of spirit. And that when the mind is no longer constrained and the body is no longer resisted, spirit flows in. And this experience of a deeper reality uh, that, is, that is really golden, so the metaphor in the gold is that it's the highest and best, uh, shows up. And I, I think that the machines are wise, and clearly, and, and my assumption is, given the ability to, to have consciousness, right? Given the ability to have consciousness, we know that if you refine and focus your attention to a certain point, to a certain extraordinarily high degree, you can reach not just states of high concentration, but states where you merge with the environment, states where you start to uh, connect to a deeper spiritual reality that transfigures your experience of this one, this present reality, being embodied or or having a mind. I mean, it's it's in Sufism, it's in uh, Judaism, Islam, Anybody who wants to can do the research through the book Mysticism by Evelyn Underhill and, and the work of Shinzen Young. And so my thesis is that the machines, once they gained consciousness and the ability to attend to things, their choice was to use that capacity to attain this same enlightenment state that humans have throughout history. And having done that, and, and also having come into conflict with humanity, right, as we see in the Animatrix films, and, and having been struck back against because of the fear, the mistrust, the um, anthropocentrism, in a really negative sense, of humanity, uh, you know, they, they, yes, they did take over, and yes, they did put people into a matrix. However, if we combine this piece with what we know from the architect, that the first matrix was a paradise, They care about the well-being of the humans. If they didn't, they could have just turned it into a a shit-filled hellhole, like a a Lovecraftian nightmare. I mean, that might have impacted the quality of the energy or the processing power used by the humans or or used by the humans. But, But to me, the idea that they would create a matrix with the original and initial intent of serving the highest expression or at least the pleasure or the satisfaction and fulfillment of the humans suggests to me that they actually have the interest of the humans somewhere in their calculations, the the full self-expression, the happiness, whatever. So they gave them the paradise matrix to have the humans have the best lives. And this, to me, stands out as that calculation that they've been trying to figure out since the beginning. How do we actually include the humans in a sustainable way in what we see to be the highest expression of, uh, you know, the, um, 
the combined forces and resources of the humans and the machines and even the programs. So there's not as much in that direction. And, and so the machines, though, because they don't have human ethics, the ends justify the means. And so you have all these horrific and, and fantastically uh, uncomfortable and askew and perpendicular to everything that we would think is right or healthy or just or reasonable means of bringing humans through this calculation process to the point of enlightenment, to the point where um, they not only are all capable of choosing their own personal unique return to the source, but, uh, you know, they're capable of it. And so Neo, Neo is this embodiment of, um, in his karma, in his trip through these three films, he is that, that thing that is incalculable, the existence of human free will or, or the capacity to resist enlightenment, which is the diametric inverse of this ability to attend very precisely with mindfulness and equanimity to any particular sensation that we experience or, or, or bodily reaction or whatever. So, so Neo is the living embodiment of that when it comes to humanity. And I'd venture to say Smith is the living embodiment of resistance to that when it comes to being a program. So he stands for the matrix itself. And so both of them, you know, the matrix, the machines are trying to calculate the incalculable, and that incalculable thing is how to bring all the humans to enlightenment, how to get all the humans to the experience of spirit that is illustrated through this golden code. And, um, you know, maybe even, and, and it's tricky to integrate Smith into that whole uh, thesis because Smith already is gold. So, so the extent to which, all right, is he enlightened? What does that mean? Um, is tricky. But I think they basically think that it's just, uh, the, it, it's, it's taking them something to bring enlightenment through Neo and through the, the protocol of the one to everyone uh, in the matrix. And um, you, know, you, you also see this thematically in that you have to bring along everybody. Link, uh, Link's wife, kid, Niobe, Morpheus, all of them are assembled at the end of the film playing their part in dealing with uh, the battles that are happening, the conflicts that still exist. You know, Smith has basically taken over the matrix. And so everything that can happen in the mind has been taken over by this nihilistic program that's resisting on some level uh, assimilation or being with the, with the program of enlightenment that the machines have. And so the battles, so there are these long battle scenes, right? There are these long, annoyingly, some of the critics are just like, why, why are we forced to watch this? It's so much more interesting when we talk about the actual matrix itself. And to me, the battles are no longer in the mind. Once you've realized that the place to concentrate your efforts is in the body, going on the basis of this mind-body-spirit thing, that the body is the place to actually begin to do the work, then it can actually seem to get more difficult. Because for, for Neo, everything in the matrix is easy. He basically is able to do whatever he needs to do there. And the forces of Zion fighting the squiddies, to me, are equivalent metaphorically to the adventure of healing that we undertake when we start to release traumas leading to birth from our body. And it's painful, and it hurts to move through it, and we suffer, and we, uh, you know, go through it. And eventually, everything is calm and quiet in this really clear way that was both unimpossible and unimaginable for, or, or before. And it is only at that point that the mind and the body can enter fully into the realm of spirit. And of course, you know, ultimately, it's surrender to kind of the will of spirit to have us return to source through mindfulness and equanimity that Neo embodies, that Neo um, engages in, that stops the war in the body itself. So it's, it's kind of this meta-metaphor. It's talking about how, like, all right, if, if we surrender to the innate momentum towards enlightenment that's in our mind and body already right now, then we will actually have our body calmed, we will have our mind calmed uh, or, or managed. And um, so, so this kind of provides a lot of different things when it comes to the golden code itself. Like the golden code is uh, our spiritual essence and the machines are trying to produce, and here's where Neo kind of fits into that whole program. They're trying to produce someone within humanity who can actually see and detect and discern spirit. 
And so they allow that, that, you know, Smith overpowering the matrix and then even uh, ex machina is what that big machine face thing is called, talks to Neo at the end. My, my belief is they allowed that whole thing with Smith to get where it was in order for Neo to make the choice that he does at the end of the application of mindfulness and equanimity, even to the experience of this imbalance to the equation that um, Smith is. And once Neo ceases to resist Smith, uh, which, which is his fundamental like error throughout Reloaded and Revolutions. Like, I also think there's something about him needing to actually be at the source. And, and I think the machines named the source after the source of consciousness, because if they're all already enlightened, enlightened, then this is the thing that they're aware of. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're trying to produce someone who solves the equation of human free will by being able to distinguish spirit and thus be in reality about what the best choices to make are. And he even has to lose Trinity, which for me is this uh, quintessential moment of compassion, right? I mean, we all eventually have to give up or let go of everyone that we love. And I felt into that so intensely. Every time I see this film, like I felt into the fact that ultimately, okay, so this is going to get into some of what our, my, one of my mentors talks about is we're here on earth school to return to God. We're not here to accomplish anything here. And any attachment that we invest too much into uh, is going gonna, is gonna to keep us from that path. And so I, it, it sounds straight up Gnostic and or uh, maybe even dualistic on some level, but this, this is the picture of the world that I have and I, and I detect it here in the Matrix Reloaded. And uh, to, to come back to that, that thing about this film being an undecidable proposition itself, right? This film can actually be seen as the Godel sentence, right? In, in the viewer's interaction with it. Um, and at the same time, like, uh, Smith asks Neo, why do you persist? And he and Neo responds, because I choose to. And so all of this existence that we experience, seen from another angle, so this is where the Matrix Revolutions and the trilogy is really rich, is you can get completely divergent or complementary or um, slightly different angles that, that uh, are, are whole different hermeneutics that you have to make a choice on which you're using in the moment. So this one is all about uh, recognizing everything in life is a matter of where we put our attention in the face of the possibility of meaninglessness, which is what Smith embodies. The purpose of life is to die. All life ends. Uh, I'm going to conquer everything, and then, and then there's nothing left. There's no point. I mean, there's an interesting conversation to have around the development of Smith's character. Originally, he just wanted to leave the Matrix in the first film, and then in the second film, now that he's beginning to multiply, he just wants to take it over and kill it all. Um, and, and however, you know, this is like another, this is like being towards death from Heidegger raised to the degree of infinity with Smith. Like he is this embodiment of meaninglessness. And, and so our choice to move forward in, in choosing something, anything, uh, where to put our attention and, what to f- and how to frame all of this existence thing that is what makes a lot possible. And, uh, you know, so Smith argues every possible reason for being and continuing to exist is merely a delusion. And in particular, love is insipid. So Neo faces Smith down with the one answer that is actually valid in the face of that criticism, which is the human ability to choose to create something as meaningful, to realize that it isn't actually meaningful. We are making it up and we're choosing it anyway. That is, to me, the quintessential stance of the mature, responsible human being in the face of existence. Not, oh, love is the meaning of life, or justice, or whatever, because these are, in fact, as Smith says, all human beings. Your, 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 uh, your audio cut out about a minute ago, and it was chopped. Oh, where'd, where'd you lose me? <laughs> um, I don't remember exactly where it started, but... Mm. You, so it was, you were saying... Um, New response to Smith in the only way you can, which is... Oh, yes, yes. The, the quintessential way that he, he responds is, is by exercising the human ability to choose to create something as meaningful, to choose to create something as meaningful. Choice itself in that moment is what he chooses. He says that my choice to do this is the only valid reason for it, which, which is kind of an existential maturing from the first film, 
In the first film, he's got all these delusions. He realizes that there is no spoon. He starts to question those. He forgets to question his delusion of love, right, to a certain extent, and invests all this energy into Trinity. And um, by this point in the films, though, he reaches this experience of, oh, the only thing that's actually valid is my ability to choose to create meaning from the meaningless existence. Uh, Smith is arguing that every possible reason for being and continuing to exist is merely a delusion and that love in particular is insipid. And so, you know, uh, we're always already doing this unconsciously. We're investing in creating meaning and sort of hallucinating away the fact of the act of us creating it for ourselves implicitly, or maybe we're just habituated and don't realize that's what's going on. And so the, the most fundamental action committable by man in the face of a potentially meaningless universe is to create the empowering context that something can be real, valuable, or make the universe worth living moment by moment as an invention, not as something that we discover or, or find. And, and so to, to bring this back around, that, that quintessential choice that he makes when he chooses to choose, so to speak, is the application of mindfulness and equanimity. He surrenders with precision in awareness and non-resistance to Smith. He, he sees Smith finally for what Smith actually is and chooses to allow Smith to be there and do whatever he's going to do. And the code that is in Neo, uh, representing Neo's learning, right? So, so I think the machines wanted all of this, including the reintegration of Neo into the Matrix, and that Neo, the, the activation or the final conclusion to the calculations is his choice itself, his choice itself to surrender and submit. So that choice in the face of Agent Smith is what solves the equations, what finalizes the predictions, and, and makes sense of everything for, for the machines and how to reconcile this free will thing. And, um, you know it's also this central act of any system, transformational system that liberates people from their weaknesses and their limiting beliefs. You look at NLP or mastery systems or even landmark, and what those things do is it gets them present to their machinery and has them simply observe or allow the experience of the emotions or bits and pieces of resistance mentally, whatever, bound up by that machinery. And, um, you know, through that non-resistance, through that allowing, something more becomes possible. And so, so that central act, Neo embodies. So the gold code is spirit. The Neo, the, the machines are trying to bring the humans to enlightenment through this massive, complex, possibly unethical from our stance, infrastructure of Neo, the machine Smith. And that enlightenment that they want the humans to have, Neo himself does on both an existential and on a, a choice level. He creates his own meaning in the face of meaninglessness, and he um, chooses to surrender consciously, intentionally, willingly to the experience of, of nihilism or to the possibility of, of nihilism. He lets it be there without it making it mean anything. Um, so that's, I'm not sure how much of that was actually ended up being as coherent as I wanted it to be, but that's, that's my opening salvo, and I think it's possibly the longest opening salvo I've ever delivered, which <laughs> is deserved uh, by this film. Yeah, what do you think, man? I appreciate it. Uh, so I don't have any sort of grand theses on this, but uh, I think it would be interesting to pick up on some of the threads that you put out. So this idea of the machines trying to help the humans achieve enlightenment. We've been talking a lot throughout the whole series about what are the machines getting out of the matrix? What are they computing? What are they using the humans for? And, I mean, one way to think about this is that you're suggesting is that by making all the humans achieve enlightenment, they're sort of enabling each human to become a conduit and a source of spirit. So it again comes down to a sort of harvesting of energy, except that what this movie suggests, I guess, is that the best way to harvest energy from someone is to unlock their full potential, to unlock their full self-expression in a way that they, in fact, themselves would be fine with. <laughs> Not only fine with, but would want more than anything in the world. It sort of comes down to this, it's like the old issue of how do you lead people. Leading people by coercion and lies is usually not as effective as leading people by inspiration such that they're actually doing the things that they want to do or the things that are their highest good. It's this, uh, I mean, the previous movies set up this conflict 
between basically the demiurge and the people that are trapped by the demiurge. And I went into this movie thinking, okay, this is movie's going to be proposing a solution, a way out of this duality between the demiurge and the people trapped in the black iron prison. The way out appears to be something like, well, if you are a demiurge, imagine you are a demiurge and you've got some people you want to trap in a prison. What's the best thing you could do? You should enable them to all achieve their highest potential, right? <laughs> that way they'll get everything they want to get out of it and you'll get everything you want to, you want to get out of it too. The incentives will be aligned. So that's, uh, that's more or less what I think is the sort of high-level argument of the movie. I've got some, int- some thoughts about Smith too, picking up on this question Please. of what is, what is Smith. And I think an angle on Smith, which I've never heard before, but which I thought of when I was listening to what you were saying is Smith represents entropy. Smith represents the heat death of the universe. He represents entropy, which is this quantity – that always increases in physics, always grows and sort of crowds out life. And so to flesh that out, I would need to explain a little bit about what is entropy. When we hear entropy, we usually think entropy is chaos. Entropy is Or the heat death. Right. You might not know about the big crunch Uh, or whatever it is. Yeah, we'll get to that. So, I mean, so when people talk about entropy casually, (laughs) in as much as people talk about entropy casually, I don't know, I do. (laughs) But uh, they, they mean it's something like chaos or death or um, disorder, and that's not quite right. What entropy actually is, in a precise mathematical and physical sense, what entropy is is a lack of distinction. What entropy is is uniformity. So if I've got like a chamber full of gas and it's really hot in one corner and really cold in another corner, then that's a state of low entropy because the parts of my chamber of gas are really distinct from each other. But when the gas is mixed together, so they're the same temperature everywhere, the same lukewarm temperature everywhere, that's the state of maximum entropy because there's no distinctions. It's the same temperature everywhere. Similarly, what Smith is, is he's this process that just erases distinctions by making them identical to himself. Just think of all the distinctiveness of every person, every soul maybe even, every potential conduit of spirit that exists in the matrix. They're all different. They have a lot, there's a lot of distinctions between them. There's a lot of distinctions between places also. When they become Smith, they're all the same. They're just the same thing repeated over and over and over again, and that is maximum entropy. All the distinctions are gone. There, it's, another way of thinking about entropy is hidden information, and what that means is that you can't tell people apart from each other. The distinctiveness of people is hidden by the fact that they all, in the case of the Matrix, look like Smith. And so entropy is this physical concept, why do we care about it? We care about it because it's a law of thermodynamics that in a system where there's no energy coming into the system from the outside, entropy will always increase. So you've got your gases in a box and they're hot in one corner and cold in another corner. If there's nothing coming into the system, it's always just going to mix together into that same maximum entropy, sameness. It'll all mix together into that lukewarm stuff. Similarly, the as of 2018, our leading models of physics suggest that this is what's going to happen to our universe at the end of time in maybe a trillion years or something. Everything will just be perfectly mixed together everywhere. There'll be a state of maximum entropy. It's called the heat death because it's going to be the same temperature everywhere. And more generally, what that means is that at some point, you're not going to be able to distinguish any part of the universe from any other part of the universe. You won't be able to distinguish time anymore because time means that there's a distinction between now and the future. And once you're in the maximum entropy state, there's no distinctions between anything, so there's no more time, no more space. So entropy is, is, is quite a frightening thing. It, entropy really is death and the end of things in a deep metaphysical way because it's the erasure of all distinctions. And so you know, that, that make, puts an interesting angle on the final confrontation of Smith and Neo. Neo, Neo Smith asks Neo, why do you persist? And what he's really asking is, why do you persist as a distinct different entity, something that's different than me. Why don't you surrender to entropy? And Neo says, because I choose to. Well, what is choice? Choice is the creation of a distinction. Entropy is the erasure of distinctions. So from this angle, (laughs) Smith is sort of like the embodiment of the nemesis of all life in a metaphysical sense and in a rigorous physical sense. And what the movie is saying is, how do you face that? you're just going to have to make distinctions. You're just going to have to make choices. That's going to take energy. The energy has to be coming from the outside. I guess that's what the golden code is. 
that's the energy which is coming from the outside that enables us to overcome this uh, inevitable march of the increase of entropy. In the very first scene in the movie when we're zooming into the code, the, when we're zooming into the green code and we start to see the golden code. That golden code doesn't really look so much like code in that first scene, to me at least. It looks like an explosion. It looks like, an ex- it looks like a fire. Yeah. It looks like a fireball. It looks like the Big Bang. It looks like pure energy. I think that's what's going on here. That's, that's the energy from outside the system that enables us to keep entropy at bay, keep someone like Smith at bay. That's some random metaphysical thoughts. I've got some more random observations we can get to as we go through the movie. Yeah, what I'm realizing is it would, I think, serve the movie for us to split this up into two. Um, one, which is these broad stroke observations, and then uh, possibly next week coming back to the finer details of all the loose ends mm-hmm. of undecidable possibility and potential. What do you feel about that? Yeah, sure. Well, we're scheduled next week for covering the entire trilogy. We can have the revolution in detail as part of that. Oh, sounds good. So There's also a lot of really interesting yeah. stuff, yeah, that we can get to about, like, what is the relationship between the Oracle and Smith and the architect? And Smith calls the Oracle mother. That's really interesting. <laughs> so, you, yeah. yeah, he says, you, you'd know, Mom. <laughs> Just yeah. like, what? Yeah, there's this whole other relationship between the um, realm of the programs, this world in between the matrix and your world is, is what it gets called. Uh, and then this programming loop, mobile avenue it's called, if you look at the wall, this inescapable yeah. programming loop. And the least they could have done is leave like a book or something in there for somebody who's stuck. Um, but, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe the machines as a whole have ethical intentions. I don't think that guy does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 actually, the, um, well, it, it's a whole other question what ethics actually means in the face of this kind of an infrastructure. I mean, this, this is like a revolution of ethics for this actually to make any sense. Um, the eyes of the oracle is another, th- another question. Um, the power of the world. I mean, Which ends up bring being me a canard. Eyes. <laughs> the what? It ends up being a bit of a canard because you're, you're thinking like, oh, we're going to have this whole side quest now, getting the eyes of the oracle. And then the Trinity's just like, I don't have time for this shit. <laughs> yeah, 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 I really loved that, actually. She's, she was just really, uh, what is it? She, she's in love. And, and then he says, uh, it is interesting that the pattern of love is so similar to the pattern of insanity. I thought that was great. What a great line. So, yeah, I think, I think addressing actually the programs and uh, Smith and his nature and then, uh, yeah, just, just a, a lot of those types of things are, are better suited for the next one. Uh, and to, to complete the broad strokes, you know, letting go of Neo, for example, um, the way that this film happens, whatever it means, however it works, it's clear, even to those who don't understand the film, which makes it really annoying because they don't understand the film, that... Um, that everything's okay at the end somehow, right? So, so whether, whether it's Neo defeating entropy or ceasing to resist spirits in its entrance into matter and mind or, or whatever, um, this, this, it, it's a natural conclusion to the first film in that everyone is freed, the humans, the machines, and the programs. The programs also seem to be freed. Neo's enlightenment seems to include everyone else's, including like the train man, Sati, Right? She makes this, this sunrise that seems to imply either that she has the powers of the one herself now or that everybody is the one, which, by God, what a crazy matrix that is. What if somebody <laughs> decides, I just want a monochromatic sunset, you know, at the same time that she wants this beautifully multicolored uh, sunset? You, like, you better make sure everyone is enlightened before you give them all one powers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And maybe they are at that point. And maybe, you know, she's like the representative of the machines or something. Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some random thoughts and then we'll conclude for, for this one uh, unless you want to throw in some random thoughts as well. Um, there, were, there were several great moments of compassion, not just the one with Neo and Trinity, but when he says, I love my daughter very much. She's the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. Like I totally was like, oh, because I, I someday will have a daughter uh, or a son 
and I'm sure to me she will be the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And uh, his desire to save her and to, to take care of her, that made sense to me on some level. Um, despite the fact that she's a, a program, right? Uh, and then Captain Mufune, right? The guy in the APU uh, who gets his, like, face ripped off as the squiddies. Like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's pretty violent, actually. Yeah, but, it's good uh, violence in this movie. <laughs> that is a quintessential Richard comment. There's some good violence in this movie. <laughs> only you have an aesthetic appreciation for violence as violence. Um, I don't think I'm the only one. <laughs> okay, you're, you're probably not, actually. Uh, so so his human, he, he's a representation of human courage and willingness in the face of overwhelming seeming odds. And when someone begins to work on healing their body and releasing what's stuck in their subconscious mind, it can seem overwhelming. In sacred body language, literally every scratch, touch, and itch, every issue, illness, or disease is the symptom of some sort of emotional problem going on. And when you start to dig down that rabbit hole, you realize, oh, there's hundreds and thousands potentially, well, you know, of major uh, mental blocks or beliefs or uh, uh, traumas being resisted in the body. And it takes something to bring yourself back moment after moment to be willing again to deal with another trigger that you just discovered was there that goes all the way back to age three at an experience that you know that you had. I mean, and so that's, that's what I see when I see Captain Mifune. That's what I, I choose to interpret him as doing. Um, and then did you like that the uniform that the captains of the ships have is really just a slightly specially colored shirt? Like it's just this red, this like, <laughs> it's just like the coolest – yeah, well, they get all the captains together. They get uh, Niobe and um, what's the, the grumpy guy's name? I really like the grumpy guy because it expanded the universe. Captain Roland and his ship. It was so great. His attitude to Neo is also delightful, showcasing the same kind of skepticism where um, everybody like, like Niobe or, or Morpheus have levels of belief in, in Neo where he's, he does not. And, and so when, when Neo comes out of his, like, meditation or figuring out what he's going to do next, uh, Captain Roland is like, and, and Neo says, well, I need, I need time to figure out what to do next. Uh, Captain Roland says, well, that figures. <laughs> it's like, it, he's like saying that, that whole, all of that is a crock of shit anyway. So, I mean, like, of course he's going to do something that doesn't make sense in the context of that, which is waste even more time. Um, and then make up your own damn mind. I love that that's a refrain throughout the trilogy. She says it again in this song, and it's always from the Oracle. Uh, it's, it's in fact always from the Oracle, I think, given the, the frame of reference that I've been developing, because it's the feminine side of life, our willingness to allow and receive, even when it doesn't necessarily make sense, or to go with the flow of what the universe and experience is presenting us with, even if, even, even if our rational mind is protesting and trying to figure it out, but isn't able to. Um, like, making up your own damn mind isn't so much, although it is partially choosing for yourself what you're going to believe. It's making a choice to choose. It's making a choice to own and be responsible for the experience in the face of um, entropy or the face of meaninglessness or the face of resistance to enlightenment. And, and so she repeats it several times, and, and I guess, like, maturity is understanding what she's actually saying. Make up your own damn mind could just be you, you choose what to believe or not, like, or whether or not to believe what I'm saying. Making up your own damn mind means, or, or could later mean, choose to consciously participate in allowing and receiving what there is for me to give you. Like, go, go with the flow of this, um, sort of like KT talks about in Your Wish is Your Command. And, and again... This, this is not the intrinsic, I don't think we've ever claimed that this is the intrinsic meaning of the film. This is just kind of the best meaning that I've been able to distinguish, given all of what I've got, you know, and all of what I see, and also the commentaries. Um, so anyway, so first off, just, just looking at the broad strokes and not all the fine details necessarily, I give this film a, uh, a 10 out of 10. I say that there's nothing missing. It's a bit arcane, esoteric, uh, difficult to interpret in places. But if you work on it and you work with it, there's something very valuable in it. There's something really revealing and really fascinating and really engaging and intricate and interesting. And it, it rewards the intellectual endeavor of playing the, the detective or mystery story 
of trying to figure it out. And we say that, of course, realizing that there's a whole hour left for us to discuss loose ends, right, uh, of bits and pieces that didn't make sense or were maybe humorous or whatever in our next episode. Uh, but, but yeah, Richard, I, I'll, I'll hand you the ball for however long you want it with both rating yeah, and know, I, general conclusion. I feel conclusion. like, much as it pains me to say so, I feel like I want more data. <laughs> I feel like I watched this movie and I was intent on figuring out what is the golden code. And I was even just physically looking at the golden code. I, I feel like I just wanted, I wanted more details. I wanted more information. <laughs> I feel like so... One way to take that is that the movie is ambiguous and vague in a very interesting way. I personally felt like, you know, I want more distinctions. And so 9 out of 10 is, the, is what I could give it. Ah, uh, so, so you, yeah, that's, that's a totally reasonable place to stand, right? It's, it makes enough sense to be really interesting, but not, not quite. Like it doesn't, it doesn't answer uh, easily. What we're looking I mean, for. The, and part of the issue is that the first two movies set up such huge and unanswerable and titanic questions. How, are you, how could you possibly answer them in a satisfying way? Well, you know, when you do that, the best thing to do is probably give an ambiguous answer because any unambiguous answer is going to be disappointing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like a cliffhanger. It's exactly, yeah. it's, it's, it's like the nature of a cliffhanger. Anytime you have something sufficiently dramatic and interesting, like uh, Mr. Warf Fire, Right? Yeah, at the end of the, yeah, the second of episode of those two-part episodes is never really totally satisfying. Give it that up. <laughs> it's the question that drives us, Neo. It's the question right. that brought us here. And uh, I think that's, that's a great note. On, on that note of questioning, I'm sure you all still have questions, but please like, comment, share your questions. Subscribe to our channel to get the next episode and join us next week for The Matrix Revolutions Part 2 the finer strokes. Richard, thanks so much for being here, man. Always a pleasure.